Our reading is taken from Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 1. On the Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God, took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also give it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, when he entered the synagogue and taught, a man was there whose right hand was withered, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts. He said to the man who had the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. Jesus said to him, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And he looked around at them all and said to him, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you all to worship God together. So thank you for having me this morning. I believe you have been working through a series of discipleship. I think discipleship is a term which inherently raises tremendous interest for believers of all stripes. Throughout the centuries of Christianity, there has been a determined effort to make disciples desiring to follow the great commission of Jesus as found in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. However, in the modern church, there has been a resurgence of interest in this area. Not always in how to make disciples, but even more basic in asking the question, what is a disciple? What does a disciple look like? This obviously leads to the questions of what methods to follow and what model, if any, from the Bible to emulate or to learn from. Of course, there are many parts of the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, where we can easily find teaching about discipleship or the responsibilities of being a disciple. We can learn a lot from the law or the Torah, from the prophets, from the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, from John's gospel and writings, or from the practical teaching of the Apostle Paul in his epistles. But this morning, as we heard together, we can see the way that Luke addresses this theme of discipleship through the way Jesus interacted with the, his opponents, the Jewish religious leaders, in defending his disciples and the miracle that he did for the needy man on the Sabbath day. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, when Jesus came into the world, we know that at the time of his ministry, there were about four circles around him. The first innermost circle was his 12 disciples that he chose. In the second circle, there were other followers, including some women. 
The third circle was those who showed some sympathy for, for or their interest in Jesus' ministry because they were amazed by the many miracles that Jesus did. And the last circle was the crowd that was always around Jesus with various and uncertain motivations. Some perhaps just wanted to watch over him. Perhaps some just went with the flow and some definitely wanted to challenge him, such as the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, as we heard Muriel read for us in our reading this morning. And in that reading, we learn a couple of controversial things that took place on the Sabbath. First one, verses one to five on the Sabbath, where Jesus defended the actions of his disciples with the word of God. Secondly, verses six to 11 on another Sabbath, where Jesus restored a man whose right hand was shriveled. For each one of these incidents, Jesus was challenged by the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were always trying to find a reason to accuse him. Why did I say the word always? Because if we look at the passage before, they did it too regarding fasting, where the Pharisees had removed the religious, the religious principle of the law from the religious practice of the law and had blown it out of all proportion. And now they have done it again in relation to the Sabbath day. The word Sabbath comes from Hebrew's word Sabbath, which means to rest. According to biblical tradition in Genesis 2, verse 3, it commemorates the original seventh day on which God rested after completing his creation. Resting, therefore, is also such an important principle that God has given to us humankind where six days they should labor and do all their work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath for God, resting and worshiping God as we are doing now here in this church. Therefore, in the context of looking closely at Jesus' disciples who picked the corn, wrapped in their hands and ate them, as far as the Pharisees were concerned, they are breaking the law, the Sabbath command. So the questions then, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath in verse 2? And in defending his disciples, Jesus pointed to the word of God in 1 Samuel chapter 21 by asking them back, have you never read what David did? When David and his companions were hungry, they entered the temple and ate the bread that has been consec consecrated for the priest only. I'm sure as the religious leaders, they must have known this, that story because it was their duty to tell others. But their focus was only on legalism, keeping the rules according to their own understanding in order to exclude others. But Jesus' answer was clear indicating that neither in 1 Samuel 21 nor in our leading in Luke 6 was there any suggestion that what David did was doing something wrong. In fact, all the law and the prophets hung upon these two commandments to love the Lord your God with all your strength, your heart, your mind, and your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And therefore, the Sabbath was made for men and women, and not men and women for the Sabbath. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law believed God, 
but they could not receive Jesus as the Son of God, and therefore they didn't understand his teaching at all. In the context from the chapter before, chapter 5, they clearly accused him of being a blasphemer because Jesus said that he has the authority on earth to forgive sin. And also when he described himself in chapter 5 as the bridegroom and how the disciples as his friends couldn't fast but were allowed to eat and to drink while they were together. Even with that clear explanation, their hearts were still hardened. Jesus then used the parable to distinguish the old and the new garment and the difference between the old and the new wineskins. For the Pharisees, the old is better. They must have wondered what right has this man Jesus to decide how God's law should be understood and lived out. It was their duty to tell people about that, but now here's someone coming to teach them how to understand and implement the law. What authority does he have over the law of God? And of here in relation to the Sabbath, when Jesus finally says the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Well, that was a clear indication that Jesus was claiming authority over the law of God. In hearing that, the Pharisees must have been shocked even further. This was a claim that only God could rightfully make and no one else. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath the Lord of God's law. It means that he is the one who gives that law in the first place. He himself is the giver of the law. Unfortunately, they still can't bring themselves to believe him and receive his teaching, even after all the things he has shown them. Therefore, their hardened hearts and stubborn mindset meant that they couldn't become his disciples or his followers. In the same way, if we continue to look at verses 6 to 11, when Jesus went to teach in the synagogue on another Sabbath, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were there to watching him closely. Well, they were there wondering if they might heal the man whose right hand was shriveled on the Sabbath so that they could find a reason to accuse him. Wow. Do you think, is that a right motivation to come to the synagogue for worship of God? Interestingly, Luke tells us that Jesus knew what they were thinking of him Therefore, he asked that needy man to get up and stand in front of everyone. While he was standing there, Jesus then looked at them all and asked, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? But no one would answer him. So he said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stretch out your hand. And as he did so, his hand was completely restored. No one said anything in this story. But instead, they glorified God because this man's hand has been restored. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious or angry. And so they discussed what they might do to Jesus. In chapter 13 of Luke Gospel, verse 14, Luke describes their response when Jesus again heals someone else, this time a crippled woman. And their response was, you know, look at that uh, amazing miracle that Jesus did to that woman, heal her on the Sabbath day. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, 
So come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. They have heard Jesus declare himself as the son of man who has authority to forgive sins, as the bridegroom, even as Lord of the Sabbath. And they have seen him do many miracles, but their hearts were still hardened. They neither accepted him nor trusted him. Poor them. But what about us? What about you and what about me? Do we really know our Lord Jesus? When we come on Sabbath day like this, on Sunday as for us Christians, Sabbath for Jews is on Saturday, but when we come to worship Jesus and Sabbath like this, do we come with the right motivation? Or do we come because of something else? Sisters and brothers in the Lord, I think the challenge to be a disciple and the challenge to trust fully in Jesus as his disciples are two different things, but both come together as one package. The practice of loving your God and loving your neighbor are key to discipleship. Jesus' point in this story is, if you can do any good thing to help the needy when you encounter them, then do it straight away. Why delay? If you can do it now, why do you have to postpone any help for others if you can do it now to demonstrate your love for God and your love for your neighbor. That is why Jesus questioned them at that time, and it is a question for us now as well at this time. What is lawful, to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? I'm sure we are not like the Pharisees. We are Christians who are Jesus' disciples, his followers, and his servants who obey his commands. Billy Graham, a very well-known preacher, once said that, if you want to receive Jesus, it costs you nothing. But if you want to follow Jesus, it costs you something. And if you want to serve Jesus, it costs you everything. What does that mean? Being a receiver, a follower, and a servant. Receiving Jesus, of course, costs us nothing. We just accept him into our life, open ourselves to receive what he has done for us, and acknowledge him as our savior and salvation is ours. But when we decide to follow him, as I think we all have, I hope, it costs us something. We need to deny ourselves and carry our cross. This is not an easy task. Carrying the cross is different from touching the cross or holding the cross. Denying ourselves means going against ourselves. I think going against others is easy enough. If someone says A, we can do B. But if we ourselves wanted A, and the truth is B, sometimes it will be difficult to drive ourselves to follow the truth. But we all eventually have to learn and be willing to do so as Jesus' followers. Learning from Billy Graham, I believe, perhaps we all or some of us have decided not only to receive Jesus or not only to follow him, deny ourselves and carry our cross, but also 
have decided to serve him in whatever roles he have he has entrusted to each one of us so whatever level we serve him we should aware that it cost us everything perhaps we need to even sacrifice ourselves sometimes in terms of pleasure energy time selflessness comfort etc maybe we need to carry not only our own cross but other people's cross as well it is hard but when we are ready and willing to keep doing that as Jesus disciples he calls us to trust him fully he calls us to trust him fully completely rely on him because what he has entrusted to you and to me to each one of us He planned to help us and to do it together with him. So as you go back home, the questions for you is, what kind of discipleship that you understand in your life journey? What kind of disciple that you want to offer to him in your faith journey. I believe Holy Spirit will guide you to answer that question. Amen.